Job chapter number 36 this morning. I'm going to read one verse, verse number 10. The Bible said, He openeth, referring to God, also their ear to discipline, and commandeth that they return from iniquity. Now here, the book of Job, this is one of Job's friends talking to him. In the beginning part of this chapter, everything that his friend says is true. The only issue is that they're interpreting it wrong when referring to Job. Right? Job had some real good friends that showed up on the worst days that he's ever had and then tried to convince Job that Job was wrong with God and that's the reason that God punished Job the way that everything had happened in Job's life in the beginning chapters of the book of Job. The only issue with that was Job was an upright man who feared God and eschewed evil. The Bible called him a perfect man, meaning that his faith was lacking nothing, which means he is just as right as God, with God on this day as he was the day before. There came a day in Job's life where all those things befell him. Okay, but his, his buddy here, Elihu, is the one talking in this chapter. And he starts listing some properties and things that are true about God. In verse number 10 he says, He openeth also their ear to discipline and commandeth that they return from iniquity. Now, as I was reading, that word discipline jumped off the page. Come find out, this is the only place you're going to find the word discipline in this context in the entire Bible. In fact, you'll find a lot of different versions of it, but not discipline. Disciplined, maybe. But then we're going to look at the other types of this word here in a minute but that word discipline does not necessarily mean to punish I mean, think about it God opens the ears of his children that's in context what it's talking about to discipline okay well first off that opening the ears what's that mean well, you ever read this in the Bible that God's people are stiff necked and hard of heart that it would not turn from their ways Right, well, what solves that issue? Well, sometimes God has to break their heart because it's so hard. Sometimes God has to unstop their ears so that they're willing to turn and listen to what God has to say. So thankfully, God is faithful that he said, if you're without chastisement, you're a bastard and not a son. He says, if you're in the wrong, because God loves you, he's going to correct you. But... Does God correct you through your ears? Man, that's... He'll always... You know. All right. Changing course. How does God correct his children? First, okay, we go to the book of Psalms, 23. Everybody knows the 23rd Psalm. Why did the psalmist say that he was comforted in the presence of God? Because thy rod and thy staff comfort me okay what was the staff that's that thing that we think of that had the shepherd took in it okay how does God chasten his children well at first he takes that staff hooks it around your neck pulls you back to where you're supposed to be right he reminds you no 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 this is where you ought to be if you go out further than that instead of the staff you get the chastening rod what's that you get whacked upside the back of the head. But if that doesn't work and the sheep continues to leave the pack, the shepherd will go out and will break the leg of that sheep, mend it, set it, and then put him on his shoulders and carry him until that sheep's leg completely heals. And then they say after that point, that sheep will never leave the shepherd's side again. Right? Chastening is not done through the ear canal. Where is it done? It's done in the heart. Right? God works on your heart to correct you. So, verse number 10, when he says he openeth their ear to discipline, he's not talking about disciplinary action. He's opening their ears to becoming disciplined. Okay, he says, and then the lighter part of the verse, and commandeth that they return from iniquity. What's iniquity? Unequal dealing with God. Right? What? Does iniquity look like? Well, you don't give God the proper place in your life. Iniquity looks like giving God... You may do the same things you used to do, but your heart's not all the way in it anymore. You may do it 
instead of to the honor and glory of God, to the honor and glory of you. Right? Iniquity is, you may do the right thing, but you're doing it the wrong way. Or you're doing the wrong thing and trying to justify it as the right way. Right? Iniquity comes all down to semantics. Okay, let's be... I can't mention that. That's later on. We'll get to that later. Okay, hang on to that. But, all of those semantics boil down to God doesn't have what you know God deserves, which is all of you. He says He commands that they return from their iniquity, but how do they return from their iniquity? Because their ears have been opened to discipline. Okay, now they tell me, I was never in the office, Brother Ed, correct me if I'm wrong on this one, okay? But in the Army, in the Navy, Air Force, Marines, wherever it is, you go to basic training, first they break you down. They get you to where you're completely dependent upon your CO and the other men in your squad. But then they also make you become disciplined. Okay? Now, not that I'm in agreement with everything that's in the movie, but if anybody's ever seen Full Metal Jacket, Private Pile got in trouble because there was a jelly donut in Private Pile's footlocker. Okay, was that supposed to be there? No. And when the drills, you know, DS starts yelling at him, you can tell he knew it wasn't supposed to be there, but he did it anyway. Why was that a problem? Because Pile wasn't disciplined. In fact, the reason that they found a the jelly donut is because he left his footlocker unlocked. Footlocker can't be unlocked during inspection. Right? How do the children of God return from iniquity? They become disciplined. You know what will cause you to stop from going into iniquity? Discipline. You know what will keep you from sinning in your day-to-day -day life? Discipline. You know what will keep you in the will of God? Discipline. Right? Does not Revelation chapter number 2 tell us that He made us kings and priests, but kings to rule and reign over this body. He gave you all the ability to become disciplined, but you're the one that has to become disciplined. You have to choose to become disciplined. Discipline isn't something that you can just give to somebody. It has to be worked at. It has to be earned. Discipline is an exercise of your will or that willpower that God gave you. Because God made man a free moral agent. He wanted man to worship God because man loved God, not because man had to. You have a choice. Discipline is controlling which choice you make. Not always the easiest decision, discipline makes the right decision. Not always the convenient decision, discipline does the one that will most satisfy the will of God. Discipline doesn't look at what man thinks, discipline looks at what God thinks. To be disciplined, you have to have a strong will. And whether you realize it or not, you're either disciplined in the things of God or you're disciplined in the things of the world. And you'll be disciplined in whichever one you want to be disciplined in. Right, Y'all ever think, talking about different derivations of the word discipline, you know why Jesus called them disciples? Write out both words. They start a whole lot. A disciple is one that has become disciplined in what Jesus was teaching them. You don't send somebody out who's fresh and green and apt to make mistakes on their own. Even those that he called disciples, how did he send them out? Two by two. He sent them out in pairs, why? So that they would have help should they need it. You don't become a disciple until first you are disciplined in what Christ has taught. So that's what we'd like to teach on this morning. Discipled, or disciplined disciples. Disciplined disciples. Now discipline, not talking about correction, discipline talking about controlling what it is you do. Okay, Christian and I can tell you. He's been, the past four weeks of his life and the past three weeks of my life have not been fun. And that is because we both started a diet. Okay, in fact, I had to start the diet because he started the diet. I didn't have an option. My primary care nurse told me that I had to, and that's also my mom, okay? 
But we both lost a chunk of weight already. You say, how'd that happen? I have to look at the things I used to eat and say, no. That's very hard because I don't eat things that don't taste good. Okay? I have tried abominations such as a crustless pizza. That's just warm pizza sauce with cheese and ingredients. Okay? It's a bunch of nonsense is what that is. They said, you want to try cauliflower? No, I don't want to try the cauliflower pizza. Okay, that's not pizza anymore. I have tried such things as a lettuce wrap sandwich, which is where they take the sandwich and there's no bread on it. It's not a sandwich if it doesn't have bread. Okay, now, do I like the things that I am now eating? No. Okay. Every now and then, I would like to eat less on one day just so that I can have like a three-way the next day. Okay. <laughs> I'm making trades. Like, I'll be miserable today just to be a little bit more happy tomorrow. Okay. But after I have one three, I don't keep going. Right. What, what is, you know, is it fun? No. But... What's the alternative? Right? I don't know. Don't want to find out is really the thing. I stopped drinking sweet tea many, many years ago. Everybody now knows I drink Diet Mountain Dew. That's because I put so much sugar in sweet tea that when I drank it, if I'd have kept drinking it, I'd have gotten diabetes at like 25. Okay? Can't do that. I used to put two cups of sugar in every gallon that I made. Right? Why? Because I liked it sweet. I didn't like tea. I liked sugar. <laughs> right? So... We stopped that. I don't want diabetes. Okay. Also, I decided I wasn't going to let myself get over 300 pounds ever. Right. And we got too close to that number and we're like, all right, we need to stop, start going the other way. Okay. Now, I'll never get to what the doctor's chart says I'm supposed to be at. Because if I was that tall with shoulders as wide as I have, right, and was as weight as little as it, I'd look like somebody that came out of a concentration camp. You think I'm kidding? Like the chart says I'm supposed to be like 182 pounds. That ain't going to happen. Right? In the best shape of my life, I was 225 playing football. Right? Well, what's all that guy say? How did Christian and Jordan, being miserable as they are, why do they keep doing it? Because of discipline. Right? Because I look, now I did find out I have like a chart that says I can have this many carbs and this many cal calories per meal. And guess what comes right underneath of the breakfast slot? Pop-Tarts. So I still get to keep my Pop-Tarts, but I can only have like one pack of them now. So, so we're just like, basically sometimes we're just eating the same thing, only less of it, okay? But still get to keep my Pop-Tarts, but why don't I eat anything else besides the Pop-Tart? Because I have now decided to be disciplined. Right, well, in your spiritual life, you know there are certain things that are continuing to grow, continuing to fester. Why haven't they been nipped in the bud already? No discipline. Those things that you know are a problem, that in the back of your mind you say, well, well you know, after I get this sorted out, after I get that sorted out, then we'll tackle that issue. But you know why you'll never tackle that issue? Because you don't want to be disciplined to do it. There's always going to be something coming up in your life that you can say, well, if I address this first, God didn't say that, you know, be ye as holy as you can be. He said, be holy. Because he's holy. In fact, if you're not, you know, anything less than holy, it's not holy. You can't be as holy as you can be because we can't be holy. We have to become that new creature. Well, how do you do that? Discipline. You know why so many people think that they're serving God, but actually they're living for the world? Because a man cannot serve two masters. He'll love one and hate the other. You may be disciplined enough to do certain things in your life, but unless you're all in and God has all of you, you cannot serve two masters. Even if the other master is yourself. Not going to lie. I haven't had Domino's in like three weeks. It's killing me. Mostly because I still have a free pizza left on the Domino's app. And I know I'm not going to use it for like a very long time now. Why? Because Jordan would sit down and eat an entire medium Domino's pizza, usually between two meals. Okay? Yeah? 
Not even a problem. I could do that and then eat snacks like 30 minutes later. Right? Don't be, Christian and I could shut down a few all-you-can-eat restaurants if we wanted to. I'd put them right out of business. But, well, what's the other version of that? Is pizza bad for you? I have learned no, but there's no place that I can just go buy like two slices of pizza that are like a decent quality pizza. I can't just walk into the roses and be like, hey, can I have two pieces of this? No, not going to happen. They're not going to sell it to me. They're like, you got to buy the whole thing. Well, if I get the whole thing, I know I'm going to eat the whole thing, so we're just not going to order the thing. Okay? Well, on the other side of it, pizza may not be a bad thing. The Bible says there's blessing and cursing and everything. Right, you want to know why some people don't have a problem with the phone? Because they are disciplined enough that they can set the phone down. That they have enough understanding of themselves and enough understanding of that thing and what God expects of them that they know, hey, if I spend any more time on this, I can't do what God wants me to do. If you can put it down, you're disciplined. Just being honest. If you can pick up your Bible and study it as unto the Lord, not unto man, but you're studying to show yourself approved unto God, you can sit down and shut everything else out while you're studying, you're disciplined. Even though life may be hectic and every time you get down to pray, you know, of course, the devil's going to try and fight it every way that he can. But if you can get into your prayer closet, if you can kneel at the rock altar, at this altar, wherever it is, and if you can shut out the carnal mind and embrace conversation with God through the Spirit, you are disciplined. Now, as I've said, discipline does take effort. But, does not the Bible say that no temptation hath taken you except that which is common to man? You know what that means? Everything that you experience, that those things, that weight that does so easily beset us, right, those things that all of us have to deal with each and every day, your load's not any heavier than anybody else's load. So if one person can be disciplined, all can be disciplined. If one person can set aside the weights that would hinder them from running the race as God would expect them to run the race, then everybody can do it. Because if you can take it off, you know what that means? You were the one that put it on. If you can lay it off, that means God didn't give it to you. Because if God gave it to you, you'd be stuck with it. If you can take it off, that means you had the power and you were strong enough to lift it and put it on in the first place. Now, in all fairness, you may have been strong enough to pick up that one pound weight and put it on you, but after you do that about 100 times, you can't just pick up all 100 and take them off. you got to be disciplined to take them off individually like you put them on. Into it, not to stop halfway through. Wow, I'm I'm feeling a whole lot better. Feels like that burden that I had on myself is about half as light. Yeah, we'll keep going until it's all the way off. Half as light isn't good enough because you're still hindered. You're still encumbered. You know that means you cannot do what God wants you to do. Discipline understands the difference between improvement and perfection. We're never going to reach sp spiritual perfection in this flesh. But discipline strives for it. Discipline says, I want to be all that I can be. Not all that I'm satisfied with. Now, let's take another... I don't think Christian was old enough to remember... He might have been old enough to remember this. But in the summer of 2000... We went to Washington, D.C., and I remember there's a big old cassette tape that these kids don't know about no more. I don't know what a VHS is anymore. But we had a recording that we took at the Tomb of the Unknown Sol Soldier in Arlington. Now, we did the changing of the guard. In the summer, they do it every 30 minutes. In the winter, they do it every hour. But I've done a lot of reading into everything that went 
behind, you know, we just see the actual change of the guard. We don't understand why it is that they do everything that they do. But before new guard can take over and relieve old guard, they have to go through a white glove inspection from their commanding officer. Now, a white glove inspection is a whole lot different than just an inspection. A white glove inspection means that if there is anything, literally anything, that isn't up to the, not the soldier's level of satisfaction, to the commanding officer's level of satisfaction. If he goes down through the rifle and the bayonet comes off, that guy's going back in and he's getting reprimanded. He's not getting to guard the tomb of the unknown soldier. If there's a crease in his pant leg that the CO doesn't like, he's not getting to guard the tomb. Because that's the highest honor that for the army that they could ever be given. That they're guarding the ones that gave their lives and will never have any recognition. No one will ever know who they were, but yet they were still disciplined enough that they were going to go and fight against those things that threatened their homeland and give their life for it even if nobody knew who they were. So it is expected that your best be given as a guard at the tomb of the unknown soldier. And I saw a video one time where the soldier that was supposed to be on guard didn't get to guard. And it was because his pant leg, the cuff was flipped inside out. Now if he'd have looked in the mirror, he wouldn't have seen it because it was on the back of his leg. But the CEO came out and started inspecting and he said, you got to go back in. They brought somebody else out. Started the whole thing over again. See, it's not what I'm satisfied with. It's what God's satisfied with. Discipline understands the difference between good enough for Jordan and what God expects. Discipline understands the difference between what I'm willing to give and what I'm able to give. See, we're all willing to do something, but are we giving what we are able? I'm not talking about money, I'm talking about of yourselves. Everybody's got a point where what God wants you to do is going to be uncomfortable to the flesh. You're going to have to give more time, you're going to have to give more devotion, you're going to have to give up something that you like in order to be right with God. Then you may not have to give it up entirely. You may just have to give up this much of it, but even that much of it, you don't want to give up. You know why you don't? Because you're disciplined to do what you want to do and not what God wants you to do. You've taught yourself that you can do what you want to do and still be right with God, even if that's wrong. You don't care whether you're right or wrong, you just care that you get to do what you want to do. You want to know why some of the youngins around here act like heathens when they're not around their parents? Because they're not disciplined to be like they are with their parents when they're around their friends. You want to know why... Let's just back up. What's the Bible say the responsibility of a parent is? To raise that child in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You know what admonition is? Correction. The nurture means to have them grow, both physically and spiritually, to the best that you can give to that child. Admonition means that you open their ears to discipline and show them the importance of being able to be as God expects them to be. Why do parents correct children? To show them right from wrong. You want to know why some of the kids... I mean, we've been, we've been at this a long time. I've seen a lot of people come in and out. A lot of people, not tooting my own horn, Brother Randy, but all the people that have been my age that have ever come, I'm the only one left. That breaks my heart. But you want to know why some did and some didn't? Discipline. Because some understood the importance of doing what God expected while others only sought the importance of doing what they wanted. Now, did we run them off? No. 
They chose to go. You want to know why some of the youngins around here keep getting in trouble? Because instead of admonishment, you'll make excuses for them. Some of them, they got y'all wrapped around your fingers so bad that they can just bat their eyes at you and, oh, well, he didn't mean it. Doesn't matter if, if I meant to kick the person, right? Maybe I couldn't have even known they were there, but why in the world was I just kicking around in the middle of the church? Right? Now, if they're smart, they'll understand the difference. It's not a matter of what I want to do and what I don't want to do. It's a matter of right and wrong. Not according to dad, not according to the preacher, but according to Almighty God. And if they're smart, they'll pick up on that pretty quick. You know how I know that? Because that's how I was. Didn't get a lot of whoopings. Okay? If they're not smart, they'll be like Christian. Where Christian will say, well, I didn't mean for the rock to end up on top of the roof of the old church building. Doesn't matter. You threw the rock up there, you get whipped. Right? I didn't mean for the RC car to get caught in Sydney's hair when I put it in there and turned the wheels on. Doesn't matter. It happened. Stop doing dumb stuff. And it took him a whole long time to stop doing dumb stuff. Because right? it took him longer. To it's not about intent. It's about outcome. But I didn't mean to offend that person. It doesn't matter. You offended him. In fact, does not the book of James tell us that if any man can offend not in word, that man is a perfect man, able to bridle the tongue and control the whole body. You know why so many people just say things without thinking? They're not disciplined. If you can control your tongue, which according to that chapter of the book of James, it's set on fire of hell. Right? And it speaks out of the abundance of the heart, and your heart's deceitfully wicked. No man can know it. If you can bridle them two suckers, you're disciplined. And if you can discipline your tongue to say that which is fruitful, that which is beneficial, that which becometh someone that claims to be a disciple of God, then you truly have mastered Right? Or you have completed the discipline of controlling the flesh. Now, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. Who this week has said something that they didn't mean to say? Right? We're all guilty of it. What am I saying? None of us have arrived. But there's still those that have discipline and those that don't. Discipline looks at what is expected and makes sure that it happens. You say, well, what's that mean? Well, if you're like me, usually on Saturdays, unless I've got to work the Saturday shift, I've got a, like an idea of, well, if I could get these things done today, that'd be good. Because I know that I'm not going to be able to get all of them done, but I'm shooting to. Discipline looks at the list and says, I'm going to cut out whatever I need to cut out to make sure that the list gets done. Discipline will sacrifice non-essential for essential. Well, non-essential is fun. True. But there's a time to plant and there's a time to reap. There's a time to labor and then there's a time to enjoy the benefits of your labor. Discipline understands that. Discipline understands that not doing the right thing one day slowly turns into a habit. You know what a habit is? You have let yourself become disciplined in something that you know you shouldn't be. Habitual means that it's become a part of you. Was it always a part of you? No. But how did it become a part of you? You stopped being disciplined. In truth, discipline is being able to use your will to do the right thing. I think that's about the best summary I, I could give. Now, there's a whole lot of argument to be had on, well, what's the right thing? What God said. There you go. Well, how do we do it the way that God said it? I bought one of the hats from the Phillips family. It says, because I said so, and then it says God underneath of it. Why? Because that's all that matters. 
It's not up to my interpretation of what God said. No, God forever preserved his word and has a copy of it reserved in heaven, which is why we can stand on the promises like we sang this morning because he said heaven and earth shall pass away. His word shall not pass away. So when it comes to all those promises in the word, he's saying not only can you stand on it, right? it's the only thing that you can stand on. Not for my interpretation. He preserved it the way that he did so that I would know, thus saith the Lord. He didn't preserve it the way that it was so that I would know, well, this is how Brother Jordan interprets that. No, it's either what God said or it's not. Why do you think we're so, one of the distinctives that independent fundamental Baptists have is that we have the unadulterated, unperverted, perfect word of God. That everything that we do is based on the Word of God. Because it was important enough for God to preserve, it's important enough for us to read it the way that God intended it. To live it the way that God intended it. Because I know when He looked at His disciples and taught them, it's still what He expects us to learn today. Because Jesus said that you were the... That one, if you loved him, you'd keep his commandments. But he also said that his sheep know his voice. You know what that means? Disciples know they're not the ones that get to choose what they're disciplined in. There's a shepherd, and they're just sheep. They are disciplined in what the shepherd has instructed them in. When the shepherd calls, they answer. When the shepherd says, Come and dine, they get to the table. When the shepherd says, we're going over that mountain, they don't say, well, Lord, that's a pretty high mountain. Could we maybe go around it? No, the sheep says, I'm going to do whatever I need to to get up that mountain. Why? Because the shepherd said to get there. And then when the shepherd says, we're going down the mountain into the valley, well, Lord, we just got up here. Are you sure we got to get down? No. They'll do whatever it takes to get to the valley. Not ahead of the shepherd, not behind the shepherd, right next to the shepherd. Discipline is when, what was that goofy movie? Up. Yeah, the movie Up, Disney Pixar movie. There was a dog in there named Doug, which is funny enough. But Doug the dog had a little bit of an ADD problem. And even though they were in the middle of like South America, he would keep going, squirrel. Don't know that they have squirrels in South America, especially in the middle of a jungle. But Doug kept saying he saw squirrels. There was no squirrel. You know why Doug kept looking for squirrels? He wasn't disciplined. Okay, all the other dogs in that movie, they were very disciplined. They were well-trained. Right, they did what their owner told them to do. Doug's running around chasing squirrels that don't exist down in the middle of the jungle. Right, well, how come so many of us get distracted by things? May not be there. I can guarantee you most of the things we're distracted by aren't important when it comes to all of eternity. Why we keep looking for them? Because we're not disciplined. They start with champion racehorses they put those blinders on them at the beginning by the time a horse gets to where they're racing in the derby most of them don't have blinders on anymore because by the time that horse has gotten to race on that level that horse has become disciplined they run as fast as the jockey tells them to run they turn when the jockey tells them to turn they're doing everything that the jockey's not what they want to do. Now, if you get a horse, just regular everyday kind of horse, that could have been a pack horse, could have been a horse that they were using to try and make it from wherever it was all the way up to Oregon along the Oregon Trail. You know what they'd put on them horses? Blinders. Big blinders. To where only they could see what was in front of them. You know why that horse needed blinders? It wasn't disciplined. It couldn't handle everything in their view. So the owner would cut out those things which were not important so that the horse 
wouldn't get startled by something out of the corner of their eye. That the horse wouldn't get spooked by another thing coming up next to him that wasn't going to do him any harm. The driver knew what the horse could handle and what the horse couldn't handle. That's why I always had somebody riding shotgun. Something going to hurt the horse, hurt the wagon, hurt something that's in the wagon, the guy gets shot with the shotgun. But the horse didn't understand that. So what did they do? They took out those things which the horse didn't need to see. If you discipline, you can take the blinders off. But some of us don't want to admit that we need the blinders and we're not disciplined enough to put them on. If you discipline, you can look at them and they don't affect you. And that's going to be different for each and every one of us. Right? I have not been sitting there drooling over the Domino's menu for the past three weeks on my phone. Why? Because if I look at it long enough, Brother Brian, I'm going to order it. So what do we do? We just don't look at it. There is truth to the saying, out of sight, out of mind. Well, discipline says, I know there are things that I can't look at. Why? Because those things affect me. Why do you think I stopped watching the news? I was tired of being angry all the time. People say, well, did you see that? I've told you, I don't watch the news. I find out about things when either, you know, they're big enough that everybody's talking about them or when it's important enough that somebody, like, stops and says, hey, you might want to know about this. You say, well, that's a rather limited worldview. I've got all the view I need right here. Doesn't matter what's going on outside. This is still true. This is still what God requires me to do. Doesn't have the Bible say, as a man thinketh, so is he. You know what discipline is? It's an exercise of your mind. If in your mind you purpose to become, di you will be disciplined. But if in your mind you purpose that you don't need to, you never will become disciplined. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. And the fact that as you think, that's how you're going to live. So what's that word think? As a man thinketh, so is he. What does thinketh mean? That means it's something that's true to you. We don't think things that aren't true. Right? I don't think that I can go out and What's it again? I don't think I can go out and rob a bank. Why? Because one, that's bad. Two, most of the time it's going to end in a gunfight. And number three, uh, even if I got away with it, you wouldn't be able to spend the money because they'd tag all the serial numbers and then they know who cashed them in. Right? Whole lot of reasons that I don't think it's okay to go out and rob a bank. That's why I don't go out and rob banks. But if I thought there was nothing wrong in robbing a bank like Jesse James or somebody, I'd probably be out there robbing banks. You think what you believe is true. Why do you think it's so important that the Holy Ghost was supposed to lead and guide us into all truth? Because when you think what God thinks, you'll be disciplined. It doesn't even cross my mind to go out and rob a bank. Why? Because it's just out of the out of the question not going to happen but why do some people do things that God says isn't right but they do because they don't think that it's wrong why do some people not do those things because they know God doesn't want them to do it and they believe it so much that they become disciplined not to do it now We'll say this and I'll be done. Discipline, just like faith, just like everything with spirituality, the more you do it, the stronger it becomes. But discipline also sometimes is tested. You may be able to get through a normal day without any distractions, without being able to be sidetracked. But what if a day came like in Job's life? where your discipline is tested. Where everything in your flesh is shouting to go and do the opposite of what you know you ought to do. 
Boy, everything inside of your head is going, get out, get out, get out, exit, fire alarm, smoke detectors going off. But yet that still small voice says, stay right there. If you don't have discipline in the small thing, you will not have discipline on days like that. Discipline's a funny thing. A whole lot like faith. Either you have it or you don't. Either you believe or you don't believe. Either you are this or you are not. There is no scale. But I was 51% disciplined today. No, you were either disciplined or you weren't. Doesn't matter that you did this much right. If you did one thing wrong, you weren't disciplined. And someone that has a desire to become disciplined knows that that one thing that wasn't right, it bothers them. They get convicted over that thing. And purpose to get it made right with God. But people that don't, because they don't see anything wrong with it. Why do you think God had to open their ears to discipline? They didn't even want to hear about how they should be disciplined. They didn't want to hear what God said they should do. How they should return from their iniquity. God is faithful that if you ask Him to, He'll unstop your ears to discipline. He'll tell you why and how to become disciplined in those things in your life. But as I said, discipline is an exercise of the will. You won't become disciplined until you want to become disciplined. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.